Okay, so here we are. I'm going to attempt a mixed media uh, piece with a concentration on colored pencil in creating a uh, an atmosphere. Um, so we're going to start off like we would with a gouache or watercolor, or gouache in particular, um, in that we want to put a wash onto our paper to work as like a first coat for everything that we put on top, uh, and also to give us you know, a sort of translucent base to make everything we do on top of it kind of less scary. Uh, so I'm going to use this set of student watercolors here. Uh, the Cotman uh, basic set. To see where we can get with it. And I think I want a fairly cool base to to work on top of. We're going to go ahead and get some blues in there in addition to, um, I started off with a red and a phthalo green to sort of cancel each other out, um, kind of neutralize things a bit, but at the same time, uh, you know, the blue in this, um, is going to want to make a purple with the red, but the green in it is going to want to cancel out the red. So you can get some interesting effects in the way that the complements almost cancel each other out, but don't quite. Uh, so once I've got something mixed up there, I think a little cooler, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to spritz my paper, which I have taped down so it should dry pretty flat. And I'm going to go ahead and put in my first wash of color. Uh, looking at it, we could definitely use more pigment in there. So I'm going to see what happens if I take my ultramarine blue and this kind of scarlet red. Uh, again, betting on the fact that the blue and the red component will want to make friends and the orange undertone in the red will want to cancel out the blue. And it gives us almost a Payne's gray sort of color. Get that going over as much as we can. Uh, this is this is the one place where the cotton watercolors, as great as they are, um, can be a little bit of a hindrance because they're not as densely pigmented as a as a professional set of paints. Uh, so in really trying to make a dense densely pigmented statement with them, uh, they kind of they kind of don't really want to participate. They're a little, they're a little bit ambivalent. Now in contrast, uh, just for comparison purposes, let's take a set of professional pans. And I'll do the same thing. I'll take this ultramarine blue. And you see already, uh, the color coming out of there is much denser. So for those of you working in watercolor with, you know, an intention of keeping with it, uh, my advice is as you use up pans in your student set, replace them with higher end paints uh, from, from, a, from an artist line versus a student line. So like Winsor Newton artist watercolors or Sennelier professional watercolors. Uh, this is a mix of Sennelier and Schminke, uh, which is a German company, which I originally had a set of. And then as I found myself only using a couple colors, uh, over time, I sort of whittled it down to these. And as they uh, dried up, I replaced them with, or I dried up, as, as I used them up, uh, I replaced them with other you know, professional strength uh, colors from varied brands, depending on what I could get my hands on. Uh, 
All right, we'll let that guy dry at that point, and we'll see where that brings us. Okay, so we can see our drawing underneath all of this. Uh, and so the first step we're going to do is we're going to make what on the surface is going to seem kind of like a dark watercolor painting. Um, so let's see, let's switch back to the Cotman's and see how far we can push them. So looking at my value study this whole time, uh, I'm also going to take the liberty of using white uh, as well to, you know, allow my watercolors to get even a little kind of muddied and, uh, and opaque, or at least translucent. All right, so now I'm going to have to take heart, uh, looking at my reference, that the color I'm putting down is not as dark as I think it is. Uh, but that's going to help, because what we're going to do is we're going to build up all of our dark mid ranges and shadows, um, which, you know, we're concentrating on this misty sensibility that we're going for. Uh, but we're going to mix up all of these things and, uh, and then use our colored pencil to apply uh, dimension to them, you know, to to play the part of, of the lights. So let's go ahead and uh, get something dark going for the coat of feathers of this buzzard. And keeping it translucent. Uh, one thing I'm doing to main, to think, keeping like the mindset of this foggy uh, late winter afternoon is I'm going to say that the part of black in this picture is going to be played by this violet. All right, so that we're going to try not to go any darker than this in building up tones through the image. And I'm going to just mass him in entirely. But the trick is I still want whatever I'm doing to stay pretty densely pigmented. So I'm going to keep adding a little bit of white to the paint as I go. Um, and that's going to just relate to how colored pencil is going to behave in a mixed media situation. Uh, because as much as we're going to be using colored pencil for its sort of more opaque qualities, uh, it is at its heart, you know, depending on the color and the pigment, uh, a pretty uh, transparent or translucent medium. Just by virtue of being a non-toxic uh, medium, you know, you're not going to find cobalts and cadmiums uh, in a colored pencil set. And so the approximations of those colors are going to be, uh, you know, a little weaker and more transparent just because that's what pigments are available in those hues. All right, so there's our buzzard, but we also know that the tree he's sitting on recedes down to a black. And what we want to remember is that I didn't paint him purple because he's purple. I painted him purple because purple is playing the role of black today. So I'm going to go ahead and then start to mass in this dead tree that he's perched on. Uh, for expediency, I'm going to switch watercolors on you here. All 
right? It's just with a good set of paint, you just, you work a little bit less for the same effect. Uh, now at this point, you could we could also be using uh, gouache. Uh, the reason I'm using watercolor is since this is a we're going to be finishing this technique out with colored pencil, and uh, we'll see maybe a couple other things mixed in there. But you know, colored pencil is uh, famously the the medium of people who are kind of afraid of big brushes and tubes of paint, and so out of deference. Uh, to them, we're going to just keep using the pan watercolor set of, you know, kind of portable, non-threatening colors to see how far we can push things. Uh, you can do this with acrylic as well. Uh, lots of people actually do. I have had mixed luck in that regard. I find sometimes the the finish on dried acrylic paint just gets too plasticky. Um, and any medium like colored pencil that requires a tooth to grip onto um, doesn't, doesn't really like it. that same color to give us some of these little bushes in the foreground over here that aren't quite dead. Uh, we're working from a digital value study today for no reason other than uh, the experience of doing it. Uh, and to, you know, to look at tools and media as just, you know, more ways of making pictures and not being, you know, innately of their own thing, if you will. All right. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and in this, the same spirit, right, before I worry about all these guys hanging over the foreground, into the foreground, I want to do a little bit with my background uh, tree line back here. I think it might be fun if we let things get a little the temperature change a little bit. Um, I'm just gonna see what happens if greening up my background gray uh, into this kind of unexpected but more sickly kind of tone. Uh, has an effect on on the mood of the overall piece. Now, in the interest of, um, again, like atmosphere, during this, this watercolor opening stage, it would also have been okay uh, to, you know, to introduce a little more of an adventurous kind of wet on wet washiness in that, just the overall background that we started with um, to get some more variables going in there. So... 
I state that not with regret, but just to say that that's, that's always an option. Uh, and then I think for this middle ground where there's a field with little patches of dirt poking out through the melting snow. I'm going to use a tone sort of in between what I've been doing. As my marks get smaller as they recede, I'd like to let them get a little bit um, lighter as well. Okay, and with that attended to, let's go back into these adventurous darks. Now again, just because we're using watercolor, um, you don't want to be afraid of the paint. You don't want to be afraid of dense pigmentation. Right? You can be kind of aggressive in your color mixing. Uh, in a in in the the way we're going to be building this image, uh, that's only going to help. Right, and I'm just doing, as much as I'm adhering to my tracing and my value study, uh, in the spirit of painting, I'm, I'm letting the brush be the brush. All right, I've got, I've got parameters and a perimeter uh, for it to lay down things down in. But beyond that, I don't want to um, tell it I can tell it what to do, but I don't want to tell it how to do it. The thing I'm doing here is I'm thinking about how, how branches work. Um, you know, just by nature, they always have to be thicker where they start and thinner at their extremities, you know, with, you know, very few exceptions. I'm not going to say exceptions don't exist, but there's not a whole lot of them. A large part of what I want us to feel, anyway, is this kind of tangled sense. Um, I want them to get too wiggly, though. Right? You can get one or two kind of viney wiggly guys in here. They'll do that. You get too wiggly, and they kind of stop becoming trees. You know, branches tend to they like to go in a direction until something stops them. All right, whether that is like a previous break, uh, a 
I find when you really get into it, uh, the, the language of nature, uh, is it's, it's always, you know, it's either straighter when you expect it to curve or curvier when you expect it to be straight. But I guess what I'm getting at is that it doesn't wiggle much. It turn, it'll turn. Okay, and then I've got some dried up branches on there. I'm gonna kind of, or dried up leaves on there. I'm gonna allow them to kind of redden up a little bit in the foreground. But again, let let the brush be the brush. And in the interest of color harmony, I think it's kind of might be kind of neat to let them get you know fairly close. And as a like for us to see a visual relationship between the dead leaves and the red face of the buzzard. All right, I'd like to see the trunk of the tree get a little more solid. So I'm gonna go ahead and put uh, another coat on there. All right, and then I'm going to see if we can get started on some colored pencil uh, volume building. Which, you know, the thing is we can always, as long as we're staying in like kind of water-based media, right? As long as we don't introduce oils or solvents into this, uh, we can just keep going back and forth. Uh, there is even an extent to which um, a thin down oil paint down to about a wash um, uh, is still is still okay. Um, you, you know, enough solvent can break down the oils uh, to a surprising degree. Let's let the buzzer get a little more solidity too. And maybe I'll just add a little bit more complexity to these trees in the background. I know that looks like white, um, but I think once it dries, the, the blue that's mixed in with it is going to give it a sort of weird, cool, shadowy feeling. Not cool as in awesome, but cool as in the opposite of warm. Okay, and before we see how all of that uh, ends up, you know what, let's go ahead with a dark and give my buzzer just one or two of his details while he's holding nice and still here. All right, so we'll let that dry and see what happens when we come back in uh, to build up some atmosphere with uh, colored pencil and possibly, possibly a little bit of pastel as well. Okay, we're coming in a little bit closer right now. I've got some Prisma colors out, but you can tell they're all pretty light on the spectrum. Um, and then I have my reference up as well. And so I'm gonna go ahead and start start building our little buddy here. What you can see is if we've gone dark enough with that wash, just a very light touch with the pencil,
Mm -hmm. Allows us a really, a really nice controlled build. Uh, a technique like this is actually, there's a variation of this that involves either putting a wash of oil paint or a thin like roll roller of acrylic paint over the whole thing. Um, that basically brings us back to the same kind of color theory that happens in like Renaissance era paintings. Uh, when, when people were essentially, uh, too, too cheap, uh, to make more paint. And I don't say that in a negative way, really, uh, paint prior to the, uh, end of the, or the 1860s, uh, before the impressionist paint was, was kind of a pain. Uh, you had to get your linseed oil from one place, your pigment from another place. Um, you had to you know, a good butcher to get you a pig bladder to keep it all in. Uh, once you had mixed your colors up, because the collapsible metal tube wouldn't be invented till the 1800s. So what artists would do is they would work with fairly diluted paint and just use um, the magic of transparency in layers to, to get across what they were trying to do color-wise. Rather than just mixing up a color and putting it down, uh, you would play with thin layers of paint built up over each other. And, uh, and that's essentially what we're using. We're using the colored pencil very much like you would use a glazing or a scumbling in an old Renaissance era oil painting or not even Renaissance era. I should really just say pre-impressionist. If you keep a sharpened enough of a pencil, you should be able to employ like the same rules with your pencil as we've been affectionately talking about with the brush, of just kind of letting it get in there to do its thing and then getting out again. What I'll even do, just to show you where we're kind of thinking of going atmospherically, is we can build up in our background right? Building up some luminescence uh, in those clouds around the buzzard to sort of help redraw some of his uh, contours. All right, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time there, but I do want to you know, have a sense as I build the rest of it, just what my overall value scale is going to be in the piece. So I don't mind jumping all the way up to um, the lightest light that I can I can get. Now working this way, uh, you know, we're using colored pencil here. You can also work at a larger scale and use uh, pastels, um, the chalk, chalk pastel, um, in using the colored pencil, which is going to create a kind of waxy buildup. Uh, you can extend your technique to oil pastels, if that's something you have around. So now something else I'm going to try to do is I'm going to just use the white right now to build up some of the light on the buzzard. Uh, and then I'm going to use another color to sort of glaze over it. So what I'm doing here is I'm trying to get uh, the value scale that I want. Uh, 
uh, without thinking in terms of color yet. And you can't see what my face is doing, but I'm basically, for every mark I'm making, I'm looking up at my reference and at my value study uh, to kind of see what, you know, what my options are in developing this further. And at the same time, kind of paying attention to what the, what the picture wants. Right, which I feel like that's that's a pretty good amount of what the picture wants, um, just to give that sense of what the kind of haloing light is going to do down here. Go ahead and finish out those edges a bit. Uh, the pastel version of this, right, using uh, pastel instead of colored pencil, uh, was the hallmark of this really great illustrator who unfortunately retired kind of before the internet age. So there's very few examples of his work out there. Uh, but John Collier was always a favorite of mine. Um, he was a kind of unlikely hero. His work was very impressionist-like, um, but very sensitive in, in his color and his surfaces. Um, but he tended to work in these kind of muddy watercolor and gouache underpaintings that he would then build up uh, with pastel. So let's go ahead and say, what happens? If we go to glaze some blue over that transition there. All right, we can kind of scumble it out to the edge and see how the blue lands over the dark as well. But mostly I just want to use it lightly to just affect the hue of where we've used the white. All right. Uh, we can go a step further with that. Maybe what I'll actually use is this um, now to sort of like kind of warm it up a little bit and add a little complexity in with that blue, I'm going to take this darker pencil. Um, it's a black cherry, I think is the color. But I'm going to, again, very lightly kind of glaze it over. Because all I want to do is nudge the hue. I'm not trying to you know, make anything necessarily darker or lighter. All right, I just want to create a little variation there. And just for fun, we'll hide a little bit of aqua in the finery of his finery. Uh, this is one of those cases, too, where as long as we've got our values right, you know, this this is a this is a really kind of un, non threatening medium to uh, kind of hide color with. Right. That as long as we're not changing the overall expectation of the light situation or the uh, composition we can get away with some, you know, kind of surprising color transitions. Let's see, I think I could transition a little more here. Feels like there should be a little more light. to gently get us up there. All right, and now on to the tree. Let's 
go ahead. Uh, I wonder what pink will look like here. Yeah, it's a little too pink. Let's go with a little something peachy. And let me just refresh the screen that my reference is up on. As I backed up, I realized that his beak just wants to be a little pointier than that. There we go. Alright, so. If I do this right, this will feel to you like you're watching grass grow. Um, so I want to take my time and be thoughtful about uh, these shapes. What they say about the the tree and its volumes and its bark and funny little outcroppings. I'm not pushing it as light as I can because the other thing I want to do towards the end is actually put some rain in this picture and get these things to be a little bit wet. So I need some room in the value scale to put some glistening on the foreshortened planes of the tree. But the thing I want to stress now is that in order to get this sort of effect, in order for your colored pencil to have impact in this buildup of highlight uh, with, you know, without a whole lot of effort, uh, it's really important to have gotten that watercolor to be dark enough and densely pigmented enough. just caught myself kind of putting my nose a little too close to the painting. Um, you still want to work kind of at arm's length as much as you can, just so even as you're building details that you're, you know that you're applying things and making decisions relative to your whole picture, right? Relative to your whole composition and how all of these shapes and values and details are going to mass together for your viewer. Right. You know, details should be the thing that we're invited up to see based upon the grand vision of a piece. So continuing on, or we can just kind of continue to soften things up back here. I'm looking for any areas where like my you know, little streaks in between my pencil marks are distracting. I'm going ahead and kind of softening in there. Now, something that gets kind of fun with this is once you've done your, you know, your positive drawing, right? Which is, you know, your dark over light, going back in and retracing your steps to reintroduce your white through the darks uh, gives gives the relationship between light and and object or light and shadow a very different relationship that now your light is sort of puncturing through the negative space of your picture rather than just sitting back and having everything else in the picture overlap it. So that as as a picture, there's a bit of a push and pull that you can create 
you know, with the eye as far as what seems to be in front or in back. Um, and, you know, and whether or not, you know, the light beats the object or the object beats the light, but it gives us, uh, it's, it's, it's a different, it's a different feeling ultimately is what it comes down to. Uh, if I work that down to the tree line, perhaps it gets a little more, uh, obvious because it's down here that, you know, suddenly the colored pencil is what I'm using to redraw what happens in the, the landscape down here. Right. And again, I'm not, I'm not drilling down with the pencil, right? I'm doing, using very minimal pressure because I actually want it to just sit on the surface grain of the paper. That's actually where the colored pencil is going to be its most opaque. If you start kind of digging down, um, some colors just will, all they'll do is they'll get kind of waxy. Um, and sometimes even a little more transparent. In the case of white, you can get, you can push it pretty far, but I want to make sure that I still have further I can push it. All right, once again, using using it to redraw my edges here. I should have mentioned earlier, what we're working on today is a piece of Strathmore uh, 500 series Bristol. So not the one with the yellow cover. The one with the yellow cover is actually not very durable um, for painting or mixed media. Uh, it's okay for pen and ink and okay for, uh, you know, very some light washes of watercolor. But it's not going to let you work the surface much, and it doesn't have a very durable texture. Uh, the 500 series is, is genuinely a really good, good paper. Um, you know, it's not necessarily an Arches watercolor paper, but it's very close quality wise. Uh, and it has this very lovely kind of like slightly pebbly tooth to the surface. So dry and wet media alike, um, you know, have something to take advantage of when, when you're working with it. Now, let's just say for argument's sake, um, oh, actually, before I move on to argument's sake, let's go ahead, uh, sharpen the pencil and make the, the tree a little bit wetter. Right, and here's where I'm going to drill down a little bit with the pencil. You know, holding very close to my value study on what happens here. Right, I figure if I've already worked this out, you know, no sense in, in guessing. And it's going to be on these foreshortened areas and, you know, occasional plane changes that we're really going to see, you know, that, you know, reflected shininess. Um, and again, I'm reiterating, it only looks like this because uh, it's going to be raining by the end of this picture. Actually, I didn't really want to do that right there. So that's what I get for not totally paying attention to my value study.
All right, and once I've done those kind of hard shapes, you know, I may decide just for the, again, the atmosphere of the picture to kind of put them in a little bit of a soft focus. I'm just going to come in here and gently just kind of round out the transitions a little bit. All right. And part of the reason for that is because colored pencil doesn't, you know, doing this with a brush, you at least get the, the, you know, the character of the brush to, con you know, um, communicate for you. In the case of colored pencil, it's just going to make exactly the shape you're making. And I find my default is not actually uh, anywhere near as beautiful as what a brush would do. And what I'm thinking I might do for the snow, uh, this is where I was going to say, for argument's sake in mixed media, I might actually take um, a white chalk pastel, um, which is going to be much more opaque in this mixed media setting. For So for this kind of melting snowfall that's on the ground, To make sure that we're actually pointed at it. All right, I'm being guided by, you know, at simultaneously the value study and the underpainting at this point. In, you know, at this juncture. All right, now without getting too desperate, I think I might go ahead and just take a dark pencil I don't want to do too much, but just give myself a couple more of these, you know, dark little twisting bramble things so that some of our darks get crisp and in the foreground while others are just being, you know, punctured by the light. All right, and once I can see that, now I can get a sense of, uh, you know, any other areas where my tree could get uh, built up with reflected light a little bit. Every now and then I have this urge to hit undo. Which, I mean, there is an extent uh, to which we can erase. When you go to erase with a colored pencil, interestingly enough, one thing that is most you can be most successful with is a kneaded eraser by just kind of pushing and kind of stamping into the surface. So you're you're instead of rubbing, you're pulling the paper off vertically out, or pulling the pencil off vertically out of the grain of the paper. All right, so let's, uh, pardon me, we're gonna zoom out a little bit more. Um,
right? The pastel and colored pencil aren't actually going to want to make friends. You can, but I can get them up pretty close to each other. towel to help with the pastel smearing efforts. All right, I'll go ahead and finish this a little further. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll be back to lay in some finishing touches. Um, you know, one thing that it might benefit from is a little more kind of chroma, a little more color hiding in that sky, so it's not just such a one-note gray that we can leave in, you know, put in, get in these little, like, glazes of, uh, in this case, like a little peach. All right, and maybe a little bit of, like, a pale lemon yellow. back to the white. So yeah, when I said the pastel and the colored pencil don't like to play with each other, the colored pencil can work over lots of things, um, but not everything can work on top of colored pencil because of that waxy surface it leaves behind. So now, like I, like I said, once we can get our values in place, though, with the white, as long as we haven't drilled down too hard, uh, we do still have the option, like I was just doing there with the, the peach and the yellow, to kind of uh, glaze in colors on top of it. All right, so if we like the, the texture and composition of what's building up atmosphere-wise here, You know, we can use the side of a pencil and just kind of gently swirl in a little bit of character over that value. So in painting, you know, putting it, laying in a transparent color uh, over something monochromatic so that the color can take over uh, is called glazing. And uh, colored pencil artists tend to use the same uh, naming convention in that regard. So the, the last thing I want this picture to get is, uh, is a nice rainy day. I'm going to see if I can accomplish that with a colored pencil, but if not, I have a white gel pen here. And I'm going to steal my rain uh, directly from uh, the Japanese artists uh, Hiroshigi and Hokusai. And possibly uh, an old Hollywood trick. All right, so I'm going to pick an angle. Keep that angle. And I 
want it sporadic and seemingly randomly spaced. So the old Hollywood trick was to have like a flat shower in the foreground of a scene and then have another shower slightly behind it at a slightly different angle. So if one rain was you know, coming down at like a 45 degree angle, you might have another one at a 30 degree or something. Uh, and it would make it look like more than it was. So like I said right here, I'm trying to ma match my angles as much as I can. All right, allow my lines to break a little bit. So then what I'm going to do is once I feel okay about that network of foreground rain, like I said, this is, this is just, I don't want to say a trick, but I guess it is. It's, uh, this is how old Japanese, uh, woodblock rain seemed to work. So it's not like it's the way. There's no like the way to do anything. Um, but it's a way. And to me, it seemed like, you know, I could steal from less reputable people than uh, Hokusai and Hiroshigi, to name two. And by all means, do a test patch. Don't just take my word for any of this. Right? As you're working, have another piece of the same paper you plan on doing your final on out next to you. All right, and if need be, like I said, I still have this gel pen that if I wanna add just an extra little shimmer or blip along the way. I 
wasn't sure, but I kind of like that little extra glow on a couple of raindrops here and there. that a day. I don't know if you've ever noticed from being in a room with me while doing a model, I tend to say that uh, for about an hour. I'm always done for about the last three hours that I work on something. It's always just about there and there's always just a little more you could do. Mostly it's just I feel like he could use a couple more little droplets near him so the few that overlap him don't get too important. All right, and with anything, it could always benefit from a couple more hours. <laughs>